It was 5.30 in the morning when they canceled my flight because apparently people who schedule flights hate us all, and so they schedule flights that take off at that hour. It was the week of Christmas. I was in the airport, and I promise you, as soon as they came on and said flight whatever from Cleveland to Dallas is now canceled, cue the music. As soon as they finished with that announcement, the chorus of happy holidays rung out. I was like, yeah, something like that. I had just started to I just started to go around to some some schools and, and some some camps and some churches and, and do a little bit of do a little bit of speaking. So I was trying to trying to put together a, a portfolio and so I was using MySpace. All right, that, that gives you a little glimpse into this. Some of you are like, what in the world is that? You're not missing anything. But I, I was using I was using MySpace at the time and I had just uploaded some videos onto the internet. And I'm like, well, now that the flight's canceled, I guess I'll go eat breakfast. And so I went over to the bagel shop, and I bought a bagel, and then I sat down. And as soon as I took my first bite of bagel, a lady that I'd never seen before walked over to me and said, excuse me, I'm sorry to bother you. Are you Brian Persley? And my first thought to myself was, I have fans. And then my next thought was, well, she could have at least waited if she wanted a picture or something till I finished my bite. But nevertheless, I was just really excited that I had fans. And I, I, so I, I started to motion yes, but I was chewing. And, and so she's like, are you Brian Persley? And I'm like, this is insane. I'm like flattered and honored. And I'm like, y- yes. She's like, here's your ID. You might need it. It fell out at the bagel shop. <laughs> That next bite of bagel was slathered with humility, let me tell you. And I just continued to eat my bagel in peace. She had no idea who I was. She'd never seen anything I did. She just wanted me to be able to get on my next flight, and she returned to me my ID. It's at that moment that it just it really dawned on me for the first time that my life will be lived the vast majority in anonymity. And the older I get, the more and more okay I am with that. And in our culture, where celebrity is, is worshipped and celebrated, I, I understand it was a process, where, but it's gotten to a point where I am great with that. But that's true for most of us. Most of us will live our lives in relative obscurity. And even people who are famous, even people who are famous, are famous for a season and for a place. Even the most famous of people, I had a friend who was having dinner in Las Vegas with some people who ran a casino a few years ago, and as they were having dinner, he watched as they just took crate after crate and loaded them out of the casino, and he looked over at the people who worked at the casino, and he said, what, what are you guys loading? And they said, that's all the Elvis stuff that we're taking down, because nobody cares about Elvis anymore. No matter how famous you are, no matter how big of a deal you are, you are known for a very small time in a very limited space. And yet today we pause in preparation of our celebration tomorrow as we look forward to the birth that was the defining moment of human history. As we pause tonight to look forward to tomorrow, it is a day that is celebrated across the globe in nations of all kinds and places. In fact, it's an event that even determined how we gauge time. The birth of Jesus is something that truly was extraordinary. And what's fascinating to me about it is how the God of this universe orchestrated it using ordinary people in an ordinary place to change the world forever. This miraculous, extraordinary event came about by God using ordinary people in ordinary places. And so tonight, we're going to look back at the birth of Jesus, which changed everything, as is told for us in one of the accounts of Jesus' life, it's essentially a biography. It's a book written by a physician. It's, it's a book of Luke. And in Luke 2, you can follow along on the screens where we read these words, and undoubtedly you've heard these words before. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. 
This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. And so here we're just going to set the scene of what's happening in orchestrating the events of the birth of Jesus, and they have to take a census, as we'll all have to do next year. It's time to get an account of everyone in, in within the Roman government system for taxation purposes. And so they have to go to their hometown. And here is a man named Joseph who is an ordinary man, but he comes from the lineage of a king, of an extraordinary king, of a king you may have heard about and who has sculptures still of him throughout Europe to this day, the King David. And here was Joseph from his line, from the line of David. He is the one that everybody looked back to and said, we aren't as well known, but he was somebody who accomplished incredible things. He was somebody who did extraordinary extraordinary things. He was a great king. And they look back. But Joseph, he's an ordinary guy, making his way to his hometown, the town of Bethlehem, which is a small, ordinary town. Nothing extraordinary about it whatsoever. But that's his hometown. An ordinary guy from a small, obscure place to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And so he is going with Mary to whom he's engaged, and she is pregnant. And in that society, that is scandalous, and that is a huge deal, and everybody is talking about this. Because that just didn't happen. And so if there's any notoriety to be had of this ordinary guy going back to an ordinary small town, if there's any notoriety to be had, it's for all the gossip and everybody talking about him for all the wrong reasons. And there he and Mary go back to register for the census which they have to register. And we love to think of this, we love to think of this picture as a picture of dedication that there she is, so pregnant, and yet she's going on the journey with her fiancé, and we love to think about the devotion that Mary and Joseph had for one another, but maybe this is more about desperation than it is about love and devotion. Maybe this is about the desperation of the fact that nobody understands what's going on, and nobody wants to be seen or associated with them, and maybe this is about the desperation that they're all each other has. And they're on a journey. And it's time to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Mary gives birth to Jesus. She wraps him tightly. And they go out into a barn and place him in a manger because there's no place for them in a hotel. Are you kidding me? There's no place for a woman who's pregnant with child? This is like when you go to Disney World and you see every 35-year-old able-bodied man sitting down in a seat on the bus where they're bussing you off to the resort and you have mothers holding two children exhausted from the day and they're asleep on both of her shoulders and the men just sit there and watch her stand on the bus ride back to the resort and you're like, give up your seat, really? There's no accommodations that could be made here? for a very pregnant woman and so she's outside there's no place for them and maybe that's exactly how you feel in your life right now maybe everything in your life has told you there's no place for you maybe you feel that way in society maybe you feel that way honestly with your family or maybe there is no family 
Maybe tomorrow and tonight is going to be really, really difficult because you're it. And you feel isolated and you feel alone. And you look out and all you see is what seems like everybody else just so happy and they're they just have the perfect Christmas that's planned and everything's, everything's going to be great and their dinner's going to be perfect and they're going to give each other gifts and everybody's going to give each other the perfect gift and everybody's going to love it and there isn't going to be any fighting or bickering whatsoever and it's just going to be, oh, it's just going to be so warm and you're going to write a Hallmark movie of your Christmas. It's just going to be your Christmas because it's so perfect. In fact, you're going to wake up, and there's just going to be hot cocoa made for you. Not because anybody woke up and made it, but it's just that magical. The reality is, for most, quite different. Some of you have been dodging the invitation for tomorrow because you don't want to be there. And you've, you've managed to figure out how you could schedule it accordingly so that you don't have to be there, or how you could minimize it all alone. See, the reality is this, this is a time of year that can be incredibly, incredibly difficult for so many people. And for some people, it's because you feel isolated and alone. And for other people, you just wish you had a little more isolation and a little more alone time because you're going to be all familyed out. And by tomorrow night, you are going to swear that you will not see them again until Thanksgiving. And you'll be all right with it. And you'll be perfectly fine. Here are Mary and Joseph in a world where it feels like it's passed them by, in a world where they feel isolated and alone, in a world where they're on the outside looking in. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. These are shepherds on the night shift. This wasn't exactly the job that you dreamt of. This wasn't exactly the job that everyone was angling for, being a shepherd on the night shift. And all of a sudden, while they're watching over their sheep, while they're watching over their flocks at night, the sky lights up like a firework display. And we take for granted lights in a night sky because of cities and everything else that we're accustomed to. We're, we take for granted the fact that there's light in the sky, but they're used to a night that is just pitch black, and you can see stars for miles, and the moon looks incredible on display, and all of a sudden, the night sky looks like the middle of the afternoon, and it's fireworks, and it's bright, and it's radiant all over the place, and they were filled with great fear. As is to be expected. And an angel said to them, fear not, which is easy for the angel to say, (laughs) fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. And I can't prove this, but I swear if I was there, you can hear one of the shepherds ask, Asking another one, what was in the brownies that we just ate? (laughs) Now Luke doesn't record that for us, but I'm telling you, it happened. Fear not. Great joy for all people. The message of the angels is one that there is great joy for all people because there is hope for all people because love has come to this world. 
Jesus, Jesus has arrived, and they let, they let this message be known for all to hear that Jesus is the greatest gift that you or I could ever ask for. Jesus is the greatest gift that we need before we even realize that we need him. And it is the hope for us. It is a gift for us. Let me read you again what the angels said to them. And know that the reason we celebrate tomorrow is because God loves you. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. God is glorified when people are rescued. And the message of Christmas is God came to rescue you. You may feel like you don't really matter. You may feel like I'm just an ordinary person. Most people will never know my name. You may feel like what you contribute to this world doesn't matter because you live in a small town, because you live in relative obscurity. You may think that your story and your narrative is of no consequence. You may think, well, I've never really accomplished anything great. When you look at the, when you look at the story of my life, there's nothing really magnificent about it. You may think that your story in this world is minuscule and you don't really matter all that much and your creator and the God of this universe says nothing could be further from the truth. That God loves you and is intimately aware and involved in your life that he is passionate about who you are and he loves you. So much that he came to rescue you. And when the the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. The only solution they had is let's go see. Let's go see what we've just discovered. Let's go see what we've just heard about. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds had told them. They couldn't contain what they discovered. They couldn't keep it to themselves they had had an encounter. They had seen the glory of God. They had, been told the, they had been told the love that God has for them. And they couldn't hold that to themselves. And I just want to encourage you, once you've experienced the love of God, don't feel like you have to keep it in. Let people see it because this world desperately, so desperately needs love to radiate and to shine. And here they were. They had had an encounter and they couldn't hold it in. And yet everybody looked at them and like, what are they talking about? And there are going to be people when you let the love of God shine in you who look at you and shake, your, shake their heads. And frankly, you're going to annoy them because they're miserable and they want to be miserable. And anybody who isn't miserable just bothers them. There are going to be people who do not understand why when everything in your world doesn't go right, you can still have hope. You can still have peace. You can still have a perspective that doesn't make sense to anybody because they don't have that hope. When you have an encounter with God, it changes the way that you look at life and it changes how you see life. But understand, not everybody's going to understand that. And here are the shepherds. And they're letting people know exactly what God has told them and yet other people don't understand. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. Do you notice the different responses? That Mary, 
she takes a little bit more time. And she ponders. She's had an encounter with an angel. Now, she's had an encounter with random shepherds who come and find her shortly after giving birth. She's got to take some time to take it all in. It takes her a little bit of time. And she ponders what all is happening. Listen, following Jesus doesn't mean you won't ever have any more questions. Following Jesus doesn't mean that everything's going to make sense instantaneously. Following Jesus doesn't mean that it's all going to just come about instantaneously in your life. That Mary ponders. And the shepherds, they rejoice. They rejoice returning, glorifying, and praising God for all they had heard, all they had seen, as it had been told to them. They rejoiced. Because they had had an encounter with God, and they heard the message, one that God desires a relationship, that God came to rescue. That we can look at God, our Creator, Not in fear, but we can look in expectation that we can have hope because of the birth of Jesus, because of the event that we celebrate tomorrow. We can have peace. We can experience joy. We can have hope in the world because of what we celebrate tomorrow. That Jesus came. Because all of us have a problem. God created everything so he gets to make the rules. It's just the way it goes. When you create something, you get to to design it. And so God created everything. He gets to make the rules. And God has a standard. And that is a standard of perfection. Which means that none of us measure up. And some of us are a lot closer than the rest of us. Some of us, we can be pretty close, and yet we don't quite make it. We're pretty good. We're very good. We're extraordinary, but we're not perfect. And the problem is that's the standard. And then there's others, and just the idea of perfection is like, well, whew. I mean, my mom told me when I was three I wasn't meeting that, so really the pressure's off, right? Because there's, I, I just know there's never any hope. I'm good. And yet that's God's standard for us, is to meet this standard of perfection which all of us fall short of. Because we've all made mistakes, we've all made choices in our lives to do things the way that we want to do them, which go against the way that God wants things to be done because we're imperfect people and we make imperfect choices. But the reason that we don't have to fear the reason that we can have peace, the reason that there is love, the reason that we can have joy is because God, our Creator, didn't look at us in our imperfection and say, I'm done with you. I want nothing to do with you. Just the opposite. God looked at us and said, I still love you. And so He made a way that we could be restored to our Creator. And the reason we celebrate the birth of Jesus is because God came to our world, to our mess, to our situation, surrounded by ordinary people in small towns and changed everything. The Bible tells us that the reason that Jesus came was to pay the price for my mistakes, for my shortcomings, for my faults, and for yours. And that because I can't meet the standard of perfection, God sent himself so that the standard could be met. The Jesus is fully divine. That he is God in human form. 
that there is full humanity and full divinity on display within Jesus, which means that God can understand. The struggles that I have and the struggles that you have. And God can sympathize with us in those and yet still be just and create a way that we could be restored to him and meet the standard of perfection which none of us can meet. And so we celebrate the birth of Jesus because the birth of Jesus was the start of that divinity and humanity on display. That he lived a perfect life. And the cost for my mistakes and the cost for your mistakes was death. And so Jesus paid that price for me and for you. We celebrate the birth of Jesus because Jesus is is our Savior, but in order to save us, it required a sacrifice. And He took upon Himself when He died for me upon a cross, and He died for you, my mistakes, my faults, my imperfections. And three days later, He rose again, proving that He was victorious. Proving that God wins and proving that love conquers all. But God chose to come into this world humbly. A baby being born to parents who were scared, who were isolated, who were alone, who were in the middle of nowhere. And he chose to pay the price for you and for me. We have a God who understands and who works the most extraordinary story in the midst of the most ordinary people. We have a God who understands what it's like to feel isolated, what it's like to feel alone, what it's like to be misunderstood. And we have a God who wants to offer you peace and love and acceptance. And it's right there for the taking. And the greatest gift that you could experience this Christmas is forgiveness is freedom, and is peace. By accepting the fact that the reason that we celebrate the birth of Jesus is because He came to save. And you need a Savior. We all do. The price has been paid on your behalf. And freedom is available to you if you would accept it and give your life to Him. God, I pray that we would look back and we would celebrate your birth I pray, God, we would understand why we ultimately celebrate. We would experience your love, that we could experience peace of knowing that we are restored to our Creator. I pray for the person who feels alone. I pray for the person who feels isolated. I pray for the person who feels misunderstood. I pray for the person who feels like their life has amounted to nothing. I pray for the person who just needs to let go. 
And I pray, God, that they would experience the greatest gift ever this Christmas. That they would experience freedom. That they would experience forgiveness. That they would experience your grace. So God, I pray even even in the quietness of this moment right now, that as you go to work on their hearts, they would just stop fighting. They would just stop holding back. And for the first time in their life, they would receive your love. Understanding that we celebrate you coming, but that you came with a purpose, and it was to sacrifice. That we could find forgiveness, we could find grace, and we could experience peace. God, I pray that that would be what defines each of us this Christmas. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen.